thank you. Nice conference, ladies. Um, yes, the webinar is now being recorded. Um, in the uh, in, on the Twitters, we have made for you a list of all of the participants who shared their Twitter handles. Um, that's at bit.ly slash list. And we are taking shared notes. Um, there's a Google Doc that you can get to at uh, bit.ly notes. And um, we encourage all of you to take notes in there. Um, and those will remain publicly available. And you can uh, do some quick note taking, taking when you have a minute. We've got lots of people on the line. Um, we had 115 registrants for this, which I am totally bowled over by. Very exciting. Um, we're going to send the recording and slides after. A quick note about the recording. Um, when we send that out, um, at the end we're going to have a kind of open Q&A um, and talk a little bit about the, the issues and challenges that you're facing. I um, want to give a note though, when we share out that recording, we're just going to share out um, all of the research part of this. Um, and we'll clip off the little end there um, where we have a, an open and frank discussion about the challenges of being ocean acidification communicators. So um, I'll mention that again when we get to that part. But heads up, that's coming. Um, and we're more excited about having a frank conversation than we are about recording your voices all the time. So know that that's happening. And uh, you guys might have heard a little thing about sharks uh, recently. The, um, the sharks have turned out played in the Super Bowl. So congratulations to Left Shark um, as a clear winner of that competition. And I'm sorry, Beach Balls. Uh, we, we tried really hard. Uh, good game, Beach Balls. Um, on the phone today and talking right now, it's me. It's kind of embarrassing to tell you that, hello, this is me. I'm on the phone talking, but also on the phone. Um, our, our amazing campaign lab director, Ray Dearborn, and superstar attention lab director, Matt Fitzgerald, they did a lot of hard work and research to make this SDNR possible. Um, and they put up with me uh, in our ongoing series of um, naming webinars ridiculous names, the shark in our, the acid in our. Tomorrow we're doing a park in our about California parks that you're all invited to. Um, <laughs> and we have yet to, oh, to name the overfishing in our that's on the way. We'll take your feedback in the chat about what we should call the overfishing in our. <laughs> uh, and to start us off, uh, just a, a quick graph. Uh, the Kardashians um, have a conversation that is 40 times the size of the ocean acidification conversation. So just a little reality check. Um, that though we have 115 RSVPs for this, um, and OA is really big in all of our lives, um, we still have a long ways to go in pushing through, uh, making this a big part of the national dialogue we're having about the future of the ocean. So uh, a quick reality check that the Kardashians are still 40 times the size of the ocean acidification conversation. And um, maybe maybe we could get that down to 38 times the size, or, or 35 if you guys work hard. So. Uh, we've got a, a ways to go. So, <laughs> I love this slide, Matt. <laughs> um, why are we talking about ocean acidification and why do we do all this research? Um, I'm going to give you some in-depth stuff, but uh, the quick version of that is that um, when we started um, the Upwell project in 2011, um, we tracked a whole bunch of different kinds of conversations. We started out tracking eight different conversations um, and I wanted to get ocean acidification in the mix early, along with sharks and whales and overfishing and sustainable seafood and marine protected areas, because it felt like ocean acidification was being born into the national consciousness at that point, um, that we were just starting to make sense of it. Obviously, science has been on this a little longer than um, <laughs> the mainstream media, um, so it's not new. It didn't start in 2011. Um, but just as we've seen an increasing um, drumbeat of stories and coverage content about overfishing, um, it felt like it was just at the beginning of when that was happening of, on ocean acidification. And now we're in the wonderful position of being able to look back over several years of data that we're going to share um, and talk about how that's happening. Um, and on the phone today, we have lots of amazing organizations and people. Um, there's a bunch of logos on here. We're happy to see our good friends at Ocean Conservancy, Greenpeace, NRDC, um, XPRIZE. Yay, we need a lot of innovation in this area. Um, our friends at Pew, 
Ocean Foundation and Oceana. We love you guys. Thanks for um, tweeting about this sit in our Oceana. That was super sweet of you. Um, it's not all big ocean brands that are on the call, though. Um, <laughs> we, should, we didn't put pictures of everyone. Um, we, didn't, we didn't tear around Twitter and grab all of your individual um, pictures. But we have re intentionally recruited um, both NGOs, um, evangelists, scientists, members of the media, um, and people who are just passionately paying attention to this issue and how it impacts all of our lives. And that's because at well, we really try to work from a place um, of many to many communication, um, that we all work together, that we should never work alone, um, and that there are strong opportunities to change and drive a conversation um, when we all make an effort together. And this came out of the great big idea um, that the ocean is our client, that we have an opportunity to, um, at Upwell to grow the brand of the ocean and to manage it. Um, and thanks to our original, um, our, our founding um, foremother, Vicki Spruill, who um, I think did a great job of shaping this vision. Uh, so thanks for bringing us to where we are today, Vicki. We have access to lots and lots of data. Um, the conversation about the ocean is changing. <laughs> We're maybe changing dolphins' minds about it, too. Um, and the way that we work at Upwell, uh, is that mostly on most days, Ray wears this shark costume, uh, and we, <laughs> those are the best days, really, when Ray wears, wears the shark costume, um, and we tear around the Internet, and we collect up the best and shiniest pieces of content, um, breaking news, new science, hilarious dolphin videos. Um, we use those things um, and gain those things in a process that we call big listening. Um, we use big listening to help understand conversations um, and the shape of those conversations, how they spike, what their baselines are, um, how to create some big spikes. And we're going to be intentionally talking about um, some big spikes and what causes them in the OA conversation in a few minutes. And we do all of this crazy work, um, super data-driven, um, lots of hard work, sifting through lots of content, um, because I was really frustrated, honestly, as a nonprofit communications person for a long time. Um, feeling that we had huge opportunities to shape conversations, um, but we didn't really know what the, what the climate was, what the environment was that we're working in. So Apple provides this data um, so that we can do a better job and hopefully save you guys some time, um, make all of your communications more effective. And at Upwell, um, our primary metric that we're going to be talking about today is the social mention. Um, we kind of think of this as a mini article or a, um, a, a mini piece of news, uh, a tweet, a Facebook post, a comment on a blog post, mainstream news article that's online. Um, it's anything that has a unique or URL and can be scraped um, with one of our keyword sets. And we do this to figure out um, whether or not I should go surf today, basically. Should you... Uh, <laughs> I love this slide, Matt. <laughs> um, should you uh, work on you know, your expense report today, or is it a big day of opportunity um, for the stories we're telling about the ocean? Um, so we try and give you some guidance on that. Uh, on some days, the answer is yes. Um, and we use that data um, to help all of us see that we're on one big team ocean together. Thanks for being on team ocean. And uh, now I'm going to turn over the controls to Matt. He probably needs to unmute himself um, to talk about ocean acidification. Sorry about that, guys. Um, I think by this point you've had enough time to read the cartoon. Um, this is from Jim Toomey, um, and it's a very uh, concise and also Internet popular um, explanation for ocean acidification. Um, some of your favorite ways to explain ocean acidification um, include rising pH levels in the ocean, which make it hard for shellfish to form their shells, uh, global warming's evil twin, changes in ocean chemistry that make life harder for ocean creatures, and uh, one of my personal favorites, what happens to baby teeth in a glass of Coca-Cola. Um, some of the other things that you guys shared is your favorite way to explain um, acidification were about the process. 
Um, and these were really interesting. Um, one of you, I, I think this was Andrew David Thaler, said uh, using a hot tub test kit and a soda stream to show that there isn't much controversy, you add CO2 and pH goes down. Um, another, another person said they like to explain acidification with facts, with photos, with witnesses, case studies, urgency, with consensus, and without politics. And uh, one last person said they like to explain acidification over a big plate of raw oysters. Um, so that's what you guys on, on the line have shared, um, some of them. Uh, when we did this research and we looked at 30, uh, over 30 months of sort of big data um, about internet posts about ocean acidification, um, these were some of the memes and metaphors that we saw um, really prominently that were sort of embedded in a lot of news articles. Um, and some of these are things that you know, ocean acidification communicators have really been stressing. And other things, you know, we're just sort of coming from um, journalists' uh, need to shape a story or individuals um, posting on social media and looking for sort of a, a good way to communicate the issue from their perspective. Um, so these are really, um, these are really what's out there um, in terms of sort of orienting yourself to the, thing, to the terms that are out there. And they don't just show up um, you know, in social posts. They also show up in, uh, in actual actions. So this is actually from 2009. Um, I believe it was in the run-up to 350's um, October 24th day of action. And um, this leads us into the beginning of our findings section. And so the first thing um, that I want to say is that there really are um, only, there's only one phrase and really one, two variations of it. If you want to listen to this conversation, this will get you the bulk of the conversation. Um, if we were building a, a really complicated keyword set, um, but we had to just scrape it down to like one term, this is what it would be. It's ocean acidification or the hashtag ocean acidification with no space. Um, and just doing that one thing and listening for those terms online will allow you to capture the bulk of this conversation. And that means that um, when you're setting up your sort of personal listening system or your tweet deck column or your Hootsuite, and we'll talk about more of that later, um, you really just need to set your awesome detector to ocean acidification. So now um, we're going to be talking a lot about what gets attention online. Um, and this is this is a all-time graph for our data with some of the bigger spikes labeled. Um, this is the ocean acidification conversation um, through the big listening uh, eyes of Upwell. Um, the report that we're going to be mentioning um, and, and actually just uh, released um, through a blog post uh, goes into a lot of detail on all these things, so it's sort of an eye test at the moment. But um, bear with us and um, just know that all of these uh, sort of moments are explained in detail, um, and we're also going to be talking about some of the patterns that we saw. So you can go to bit.ly slash acidification, S-O-T-C, state of the conversation. Um, that is case sensitive, so it does need to be capitalized at the end. Or you can just go to our blog at upwell.us slash blog, um, and the report is linked there. Um, and for those of you who have been in the collaborative notes and found that you have been uh, locked out, uh, that has now been corrected. So hopefully um, you can go to bit.ly slash acidinar notes and um, scribe away. Okay. Um, so this is that same graph, the same all-time graph, um, but with both a, a linear um, a linear trend line and a 30-period moving average. Um, you can see that the conversation is growing. Basically, volume and spikiness are up. Um, when we started looking for trends within this data, um, we found that 
it was pretty clear that new and alarming science spikes. Um, this is not surprising for a science-driven conversation, um, but uh, it was pretty dramatic just how many of the biggest spikes um, came because of the release of new scientific reports um, or scientists making statements. Uh, basically, this was this was a huge um, a huge trend, and it's something that can be capitalized on. Um, so Ray. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Great. Um, I apologize. I am super sick today. I am really excited to talk about acidification and then go back to sleep. Um, but I wanted to jump in here because we have been playing in this space for a couple of years now, and um, I want to share some of the tips that, um, that we've used in our campaign. And what we see from this data is that as Matt said, <clears throat> science is a very, very big driver of attention to this issue. And I think what's really interesting about it is that um, many of these stories are not necessarily just breaking news stories. Um, I think that it's really important to think about science as evergreen stories, to use um, the, the information that we have at hand as often as as often as we can, because we've still only reached a relatively small audience, and you cannot talk about one thing enough. Um, so I'd say um, tune your listening ears to the new science and um, keep promoting things often and, and you know, over and over again. Back to Matt. Thanks, Ray. Um, yeah, we'll, I'll give her uh, a big silent round of applause for uh, Sticking this out, <laughs> it's a little bit under the weather. Um, so again, going back to that um, that sort of all-time graph of OA spikes, um, the other thing that we see obviously is that um, government action really makes waves. Um, you can you can tell that uh, you know whether it's Jane Lubchenco um, calling ocean acidification uh, climate change is equally evil twin. Um, or more recently, um, the UK science chief um, warning about OA, or the EPA, or I'm um, sorry, the um, uh, 20 coral being listed under the Endangered Species Act, um, or the State Department um, and John Kerry uh, convening the Our Ocean Conference. Um, there really has, there really is attention paid when um, government uh, or government agencies or government officials um, start to address this problem, um, and we think that that's a really important thing to be aware of when you're planning your communication strategy. Um, another thing that's uh, pretty obvious from, from our research is that um, acidification spikes are really starring a recurring cast. Um, in, terms of, uh, in terms of the specific creatures, there are specific impacts. Um, you know, dissolving shells of pteropods is a really prominent one. Um, you know, there was a huge story about um, uh, huge story about uh, gallops. Um, really, there are you know, sharks um, losing the ability to find their their prey. Um, there really are some sort of resonating species, um, and and we think that you know if you look at ocean acidification st uh, media stories, they often tend to invoke. Um, you know, one of these, they'll write about one of these stories and then draw in sort of a, a list of other impacts to species. Um, and, and that's something that you can use in your own work. And this is Ray again, um, just to um, harken back to the point we made about science. Um, I think we've moved beyond a point where we need to write um, only explainers about what ocean acidification is. Um, if you looked at a couple years ago, a lot of the stories were about um, what is ocean acidification, what is the chemical process, and now we're really thinking more about what are the specific impacts of ocean acidification on individual species, on individual areas of the world. So all of these, um, these are now the stars, um, and we can start to drill in on specific impacts, and the more specific you get, um, the more captivating an, an individual story is. Uh, 
Um, yeah, and similarly to uh, the recurring set of species, there's a recurring set of places. And so um, this is just a, a few states that you may recognize. Um, this is not intended to be an exhaustive list. Um, just to say that, um, you know, particularly the, particularly the Pacific Northwest um, and Maine, um, as well as places, you know, like, uh, like Papua New Guinea um, showcased in the Seattle Times the Sea Change series, um, they're starting to be, you know, with this surge of research about ocean acidification, there's more and more research that touches um, specific places. And so when it comes to popularizing that research, um, we have a pretty simple tip. So um, we recognize that it's not easy to just know offhand what the specific impacts of the region are. And a lot of work has gone into working with local communities and science. Uh, scientists in each of these places, um, and there's a really, you know, amazing wealth of information about how ocean acidification is impacting Washington, and um, Maine is learning a lot more as well, as Matt said. Um, localizing is, is, um, is very important, but we obviously don't have tons of data yet about impacts to other places. So I would just say, like, oh, there's so many people on the line that are doing great work to get that local information and um, wherever you can localize, it's, it's going to generate uh, more social mentions because as I mentioned before about specific species, people can kind of hook into the story a little bit more. Yeah, and similarly, um, you may recognize the uh, good folks of Taylor uh, Shellfish Farm. Um, there are, you know, comparatively few human impact stories in this conversation as sort of seen through this, this big listening lens. Um, this does not mean that, like, we think that the Taylor Shellfish folks are fantastic messengers um, and communicators of this issue. What we're saying is that there's essentially a limited roster at the moment um, of, of humans or specific people whose stories can be told um, to get at a thread of this um, evolving um, narrative of ocean acidification. And it's really, it's really important that um, we sort of expand this roster and tell stories, um, continue to tell stories through specific individuals. So that means that if you are an organization um, working on ocean acidification, you should really be investing in, um, in storytellers or identifying people who, um, who can be coached and supported to tell their own stories. Um, if, you're a, if you're a journalist, it means, you know, reaching out to um, sort of the network of Team Ocean and like trying to go beyond the folks who have already been covered um, because that's all, that new angle is something that an editor is always going to want to see. Um, and it means if you're a funder, um, thinking about ways to, um, you know, more broadly grow the network of people who are equipped and prepared to tell their own sort of story of self um, within this larger unfolding um, uh, issue. Um, another finding that we had was that in looking at, um, in looking at the, the spikes that really resonated in ocean acidification conversation on the internet, one thing that we really were surprised to not see um, was sort of advocacy asks. Um, this absence of call to action was really uh, really prominent, um, particularly compared to um, some of the other uh, big listening research that we've done. And, you know, that, I think that is because there's been a real focus on getting people to be aware and educated about this issue of ocean certification. Um, but that means that there's a huge opportunity to um, start mobilizing people now that they're increasingly aware of it. There's still a lot of room to go on the education side, um, but you know, pro providing um, pathways to action is one of the ways that um, certainly we here at Upwell believe that you help people move beyond the, the doom and despair um, of, you know, rapidly advancing really bad news. Um, it's also one of the ways that you build an empowered constituency that can support policy change um, and that can really demand, uh, you know, real leadership on this issue. So I think that, um, you know, calls to action are very, very difficult, and we actually struggle with that at Upwell. Um, how do we craft something that feels doable to people, and it also makes them feel like they're making some sort of impact? 
Um, and often the call to action around acidification is to learn more, particularly because the big problem that we've seen is that so few people know about it. Um, and I think that um, as awareness grows, and it is growing, um, we need to think a little bit more about instead of just learning more, um, it's telling a friend, it's um, talking to people in their community about it, uh, supporting science, uh, investments in science. Um, so I think it's just uh, we're, we're stuck in this place of, of feeling like no one knows about it, and so we keep asking people to learn more. And I think that we're at the point where we can ask a little bit more and we can talk about um, ocean acidification in terms of humans or individuals' personal actions and their carbon emissions. Um, so just as Matt said, we, we, it's time that we go beyond uh, education and learning and ask people to take some action. Um, and one of the things that you've che if you checked out ocean acidification uh, posts online is that um, you were very familiar with um, sort of the sea of stock photos. Now, we don't, we don't want to slam stock photos um, because adding a photograph or a visual can be a real way of differentiating um, your social media posts. Um, it can have measurable, sort of quantifiable um, boost, uh, you know, especially on a platform like Twitter or Facebook. But at the same time, um, we really need, uh, we need to expand the types of imagery that are being paired with ocean acidification stories. Um, and you know, because uh, you know, many bloggers are just sort of using stock photographs, that creates um, an opportunity to give them something better. And um, this is something that we say, we're, it's sort of a refrain of Upwell to create shareable content. Um, and I think that it's not necessarily clear uh, what is shareable. Um, I mean, there's, there's definitely the gut check of would I put this on my own Facebook page. Um, but I think what we've heard from a, lot of, um, from a lot of people who are looking for these visuals is that they need to be more simplified. They need to have less information in them. Um, I have seen many, many infographics that show the full life cycle of carbon and, and how it gets absorbed in the ocean and the chemical process. And we have a lot of those images, and they're very useful. Um, but we don't need to make more of them. I think um, really thinking about what people can, um, what, what will intrigue people, what will, what will give them a sense of awe or humor or fear. And a lot of, a lot of this is fear-based. It's, it's not necessarily the emotion we want to tap into. But um, one of the ways that we've seen that it works is to use before and after imagery to clarify what's going on and you know, some of the most uh, shared images that are not just stock photos show the process of you know, a shell um, dissolving or a <clears throat> coral reef that it has been impacted by acidification um, or what might happen to one. Um, so these types of um, before and after pictures are really great. They help people understand um, without trying to give them too much information. Um, additionally, quotes, quotes are really, really powerful. So if you have any questions about what's shareable, you can always ask us. Um, and one of the other findings that we had was that, um, you know, among, among sort of the bigger online media outlets, um, there's few of them that are giving consistent coverage to this issue. Um, you'll see sort of sporadic coverage here and there. Um, but we think that the, the folks who are on this list, the Seattle Times, the Grits, the Think Progresses, uh, the Motherboard from Vice, um, is, uh, BBC, The Guardian, Quartz, and Vox are really doing a good job. Um, I mean, they can always do more, but they, among, the, among online media, they're the ones who are um, coming back to this issue. Um, but that often depends on, sort of the, uh, on a particular journalist. Um, so we really think that it's important that we support and amplify um, the acidification beat. Um, you know, if you're a funder, like consider doing a media audit to see. Um, you know, we can share these findings, but um, I think it's important to also identify where are some of the newer outlets that are getting big audiences um, that aren't covering this, 
um, because we really we really think that there is an opportunity as the story develops. Um, just the last month, um, I had a few conversations with some journalists and bloggers that cover ocean acidification, and um, one of those conversations was with uh, Amelia Uri, Uri who were, writes for GRIST, and she's actually on the line today. Hi, Amelia. Thank you for joining us. Um, but this quote from that conversation really stuck out to me. Um, you know, she's constantly trying to figure out how to translate ocean issues for the GRIST audience. And she asked, you know, what, you know, it's not just about, you know, what is ocean acidification? Where are the people in the story? What's the wow factor? What's surprising? What's actually new? And it's that she sees that people are inundated by certain kinds of language. And the term ocean acidification, you can only say it a certain number of times before people start to tune it out. And um, additionally, you know, one of the other journalists I spoke to um, said that they don't actually use ocean acidification in the headline for a lot of their articles because it, it actually results in fewer clicks on the article. Um, so we have to think about new ways to talk about it. Um, and some of the specific species and places help us do that. Yeah, so this is sort of a caveat to our earlier sort of 80-20 uh, <laughs> rule about listening to a certification conversation. Um, but uh, we go into more depth um, in the report, and we're happy to answer questions about this um, going forward. Um, so really quick to, uh, to review where I've been to this point, um, you can set your awesome detectors to ocean acidification. You should carry it hard and amplify breaking news. Um, you can think of specific species impacts as being evergreen content. Um, you can keep recycling them and remixing them. Um, you should pay attention to breaking research because that's often where um, spikes are coming from. And we want to try to localize stories. We want to expand the roster of, of humans who are um, embodying this story and, and telling their story more specifically. Um, we want to make sure that we have compelling calls to action. Uh, we want to emphasize um, shareable visuals. Um, one way of doing that is before and after um, uh, juxtapositions that can clarify the action. Um, and you know, we want to support and amplify um, the consistent coverage that we are getting um, from some of the high-profile online media sources. All right, and so now we're going to, um, I'm going to hand it over to Ray, and we're going to go uh, quickly through um, ocean acidification on Twitter specifically. Um, and Ray, take it from here. So we are able to do some more uh, in-depth analysis just of Twitter because everything is public and super searchable. Um, so we just wanted to share some of the uh, information that we got from there. Um, you can look at the past uh, year of ocean acidification related tweets. And we found again and again that news articles are the most shareable links with the top links. And the full list is in the report and in the appendix. Um, they're not really directing toward um, science scientific websites or to advocacy-related uh, websites like petitions. Uh, it's usually news articles, and um, that shows that news is really driving conversation. Um, images drive sharing. Most of the top tweets that we saw had an image attached to them, and top tweets that didn't have any images, they came from highly influential accounts. For example, what we see is some of these really shared um, tweets about ocean acidification from the past year came from individuals like Bill Nye or Bill McKinnon that have an incredible following. But both of those, um, you know, those, those were just one tweet, and we didn't actually see either of those voices speaking consistently about it. Yeah, and just to, just to reiterate, I mean, uh, Bill uh, McKibben has like 100 and I think it's 43,000 Twitter followers. Bill Nye has um, a couple million. Um, UNEP has like in the hundreds of thousands. So unless your audience is that big, uh, we really, if you want to break through, we really do suggest um, pairing tweets with visuals, even, even if they're stock photos. So what we've done is we've taken a look at who is able to drive attention to this issue on Twitter specifically. Um, and we put together a list of online influencers for uh, on Twitter. And it's a mix of um, organizations, uh, advocacy organizations, individuals, uh, journalists, uh, researchers. 
And that list is available. You can follow the Twitter list at bit.ly uh, slash OA influencers. And I'll note um, none of these actually talk about ocean acidification all the time. A pure ocean acidification influencer that is dedicated to the cause and that cause only, that, that does not exist at this point. Um, not certainly to any um, to the level of other issues. So what we want to do is try to cultivate these voices and, and really amplify the work and the messages that they send out about ocean acidification so that they see that there is interest and, um, and traction in talking about this issue. If we look across the top tweets and what we looked at was the number of retweets they generated, um, there were really three categories. Um, the first is uh, um, new studies, I believe. Is that, is that how we organize this? Uh, actually, healthy photos of the ocean. Oh, okay. So, sorry. I'm just going to blame that on my fog brain. Um, it's still foggy in San Francisco, and I'm also sick. So <laughs> you've got the stock photograph of cute otters or beautiful coral reefs, and those get shared with any number of things, and often the image itself has nothing to do with the content behind the link. Um, two, we've got actual photographs of uh, ocean acidification impacts. These images of the dissolving shells um, are very, very powerful. Um, they're beautiful, but they're also you know, they're concerning, and they get shared quite a bit. And then three is honestly the uh, category for David <laughs> for um, Jim Toomey's uh, Sherman's Lagoon um, doesn't really fall into either of the two categories, but it was shared so widely that um, it deserved its own category. Um, so if, if you want to add into that, then keep telling um, Jim Toomey to, to talk about this issue in this, in this strip. Um, and I, I noticed somebody asked on, on Twitter earlier with a hashtag seminar about um, what we've seen about video. And really, recent video has not registered. Video has not really driven, new video has not driven attention to this issue in the past year. So the most shared video in 2014 was actually a video from NRDC from 2009. Um, and this video, um, uh, it's a short documentary called Acid Test. I think Sigourney Weaver uh, narrates it. It's incredible. Um, and it remains the best video online about ocean acidification. Um, so way to go, NRDC, way to create evergreen content. Um, but this does not mean we can't um, create more videos that can be shared. They just need to be short and shareable. Um, often what we see are a lot of student videos and experimental stuff, and um, it's not really put together for a broader audience. So just to recap what we learned from Twitter, um, images drive sharing. News articles are the most shareable things that we've seen the past year. We can change that if we want to put together more um, calls to action. We can drive people towards um, advocacy-related links. Um, recent videos are not performing, but there is a really powerful NRDC documentary. And we're really not seeing a lot of diversity in terms of images, but there um, are a few different types of images that do get people talking. And I just really want to quickly say how I track um, this conversation. I have a Google alert set up, so I get an email every time anything about ocean acidification is posted online. Um, I also follow the actual term ocean acidification in my tweet deck, and this is a screenshot of a tweet deck um, monitoring. And what I like to do is to set it up so that you put in the search term like ocean acidification and you can drill down into the options for that column and you can say only show me tweets that have gotten at least two or three or four retweets. So it shows you the content that's already primed for sharing. And that's often what I find um, that we end up promoting in the Tide Report or that we retweet. These are two that I just found this morning using this method. Um, and both, um, you can see, have images in them um, and are already getting shared quite widely. I'm going to pass it back to Rachel. Hello. Am I successfully off mute? Yep. Awesome. Thanks. 
Wow. Um, we have covered so much material. Thanks, everybody, for hanging through lots and lots of research and findings. Um, and we're going to be sending out these slides. Um, and I've been trying to tweet out a bunch of the images um, with the hashtag at um, so we can keep track of all this stuff. Um, now we have intentionally um, gone through the research material fairly quickly so that we have some time here to open up the lines um, and learn about what everybody on the phone is doing. Because the Upwell is far from the only person talking about ocean acidification online. Thank heavens. Um, we have lots of lots and lots of tweeting to go um, if we're ever going to catch up with those rascally Kardashians. Um, so in the interest of helping each other out and helping amplify each other's good work, um, love to call on a few people and hear about what you're working on um, and any challenges that you're facing in communicating ocean acidification online. Um, I have intentionally muted all of you, um, but now is when you can unmute. Um, you can push star six on your phone, um, and that will unmute you, and you can just hop in and ask a question. You can also um, raise your hand, and um, I can call on you and raise a question, but uh, call on you and you can ask a question. Um, but anybody can just hop in right now, um, do star seven to unmute, and start talking. I know Deb's on the phone um, from Mission Blue, and um, Deb, you can hop in if you want to. Amelia from Grist. Um, happy that Hannah Waters is on the phone. And awesome Melissa Aaron Rank. Who's got a question? Who's working on an OA campaign? It looks like Deb has her hand raised. Um, Deb, if you want to unmute your phone, um, hit star seven. And also, if you've muted your own phone, you'll also need to unmute your own phone. Um, we double mute you, probably. Um, so make sure you hit both star seven and um, make sure that your own cell phone is not muted or your own work phone. God, this is complicated. <laughs> Thanks for being Sorry. brave. <laughs> Can you hear me? I guess you're yes. laughing. Yeah. <laughs> I think I figured it out. Great. Um, I was just wondering, we don't have any campaigns going specifically for ocean acidification, but I was just wondering if you've seen positive news about ocean acidification, because we try to concentrate on good news for people. Um, and it seems like it's all pretty dire and slowly going downhill. That is a great question. Um, if anybody on the phone reads the TIDE report regularly, you will know that we are big fans of ocean optimism. And we are trying our very best to amplify the stories that are optimistic as opposed to the ones that have the headlines like, we're killing the ocean and it's going to die soon. <laughs> um, right. Unfortunately, a lot of the science says things are going badly. Um, and that science does drive news coverage, and the news drive coverage drives sharing. Um, a lot of the stories that do get attention are scary. And um, perhaps if, if she's available, I'll ask Amelia to chime in on that, because I know she struggles with it as well, um, in terms of writing stories that are not doom and gloom all the time. Um, but I think the opportunity is around people. So maybe when we talk about species or places, we're talking about how things are going down the tubes. And then when we talk about people, we can talk about innovation, and we can talk about research, and we can talk about progress. Um, and I think what we need to do is balance. Unfortunately, we're not going to only be able to talk about optimistic things. And um, we do need to talk about the negative impacts that we're seeing. Um, so. If anybody else wants to jump in with their perspective on that, I welcome it. Um, Mio from Biological Diversity, uh, the Center for Biological Diversity, um, star seven to unmute. You might need to unmute your personal phone too. So your hand is raised. I hear Hello? squeaky sound. Hello. Hi. So this doesn't follow from the the issue you just raised, I had raised my hand before you, you got to that. But um, what I wanted to do is apprise um, 
the folks that are on the line that we have an, um, a hearing happening in, in Washington and in Seattle about our lawsuit on ocean acidification. So we had filed a case against EPA for its failure to address ocean acidification in Washington and Oregon. And next week on February 12th, we will be having the oral argument in that case. And I just thought I'd let folks know, and we'll probably do a little bit of um, social media about it, but wanted to put that on people's radar screen. Very cool. Um, and as you um, get closer to that and there's any news coverage on any social media you have, feel free to send it into the tips line, tips at upwell.us. Okay. Um, and we'll make sure to share that out with the community too. Um, that's very exciting. Um, and we've got lots of people with hands raised right now. Um, I see Jordan Stewart um, from Vulcan on the star 7 and unmute. Yeah, and talking about the positive news, I think one um, areas just looking at new research, new technology that may help cut um, the ocean, ocean acidification. So we don't have a campaign going yet, um, but that's coming. Um, we're looking to um, make the next steps uh, with our uh, ocean, uh, ocean challenge, um, the Paul G. Allen uh, Ocean Challenge. So. Um, that was another question that I had was, um, how do you start a, a, a campaign? Uh, what, what's your best practices? That's a great question. Ray, do you want to hop in on that? How's your voice doing? Uh, I think it's doing all right. I am drinking a lot. I'm taking my ibuprofen. <laughs> um, so, uh, how do you start a campaign? Oh, so the way Upwell is structured, we are here to support the work of the Team Ocean the network out there. And um, our method of campaigning is to listen very closely to how people are talking about these issues that we care about, sharks and ocean certification and marine protected areas, and to look for those little moments of opportunity and to amplify the work that is being done by Team Ocean in those moments of acceleration and, and attention to an issue. Um, uh, our method doesn't necessarily work for all advocacy organizations or campaigning organizations. Often a lot of um, long-term planning goes into campaigns. But we do, we do um, try to infuse a little bit of our, um, you know, seat of our pants style campaigning. Um, and a lot of it is based on listening. So when we see a new scientific report come out and then I get a Google alert, we might throw together some um, you know, visual collateral, whether it's an image or a video. Um, we try to find something that's super shareable to pair with it or better package the information in there. Sometimes we write BuzzFeed articles so that people will pay more attention to that new piece of science or to that new um, petition or whatever it might be. Um, for instance, for the upcoming hearing um, that Center for Biological Diversity is doing, you know, we might put together an image and, and try to spread it around the network so that people pay attention to that hearing and talk about it online. Um, but it's a lot of sort of, you know, quick creative energy. We do we do it very very quickly. We turn out our campaigns within less than a day. Um, and I would I just maybe jump in, this is Matt, and say that. Um, if you are doing something that you think will be you know, high profile, and I, I suspect that this would be, um, a combination of both um, looking to uh, online media that has say, huge audiences but may not be specifically ocean focused, um, for example, uh, Mashable, um, see, sort of seeding uh, releases there where you're going to get a big um, audience but it's not necessarily ocean focused, um, but then Combining that with um, sort of lining up partners like from our own Team Ocean, right, ocean-specific organizations, to give them a heads up, so that as a network we can ride the wave um, and amplify um, content from and, and sources that places that, like a lot of people are paying attention to, but we can also um, customize it for the different ocean communities. I think that's a way of combining um, big reach with going deep within. Um, Know, communities of ocean scientists and uh, conservationists who can really um, both provide provide credibility, but also 
you know, that may be more of the people who are actually going to compete in a challenge. Um, so that, that would be my, uh, my two cents. Awesome. Thanks, Matt. And we've got a couple more hands up. Um, Hillary from Sailors for the Sea. Uh, you have a, a question or a campaign you want to share? Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Sure can. Oh, good. Okay. I did the star seven right. Um, so we are actually launching a pledge uh, for personal action on ocean acidification, uh, trying to educate our constituency about how their carbon footprint might affect the ocean that they love. We're really focused on boaters, so we kind of assume everybody loves the ocean. and. Um, we are linking it to different trash, single-use plastic, chemicals that might be used on a boat, and also their actual use of fossil fuels. And we're calling it the NT3 campaign for no trash, no trail, no trace. And we are launching it actually right around Valentine's Day, uh, tying, since it's all about uh, loving the ocean, it has to do with chemistry. Um, Very cool. Um, that yeah, we're really excited nice. about it. <laughs> and great. I think it kind of connects that need to give personal action, even if it's small and might not make a huge difference, you know, to switch to single-use water bottles one person at a time or reusable water bottles and get rid of those single-use ones. It's letting people know that they can make a difference, and then we're going to, over time as we gain emails, um, we'll keep educating our constituency about bigger issues and how they can make a big difference. Our Very goal is to get 10% uh, of the voting community, 1.2 million people, to take the pledge. Very cool. Um, if there's any links for any pieces of that campaign that are already live, feel free to put them in the notes. Um, and if okay. they're not out yet, just send them the tips, and um, we'll make sure they get out to this community too. Very cool, Hillary. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I see um, Ian Hinkle, Kurt Baby, and Moose O'Donnell. You have your hands raised, and I also see Shannon Waters. Um, whoever gets off Star 7, uh, off mute traffic. Um, you can start. Go ahead. Hello. Hello. You... Go ahead. Oh, you go ahead. <laughs> Hi, this is this is Ian Hinkle. Uh, I'm a Canadian documentary filmmaker, um, and I just wanted to share with the audience out there. Um, we have a new film called Reaching Blue, uh, which is nominally about ocean acidification, but it's really uh, again human stories that people can connect to. Um, and so if anybody has a, a campaign and is looking for some content, um, we would be happy to share it. Um, so take a look at reachingblue.com. Uh, you can see the trailer for the film. And um, yeah, I, I just wanted to re reiterate, um, I've showed this film to different audiences in different places. Um, and I think this is where a lot of this, the conversation about ocean acidification gets bogged down. Um, in the numbers and in in the science, um, I, you know, communication is about people and stories from the heart. I think, um, and I think that wh whenever we can have find or create content that that comes from the heart, we can actually then get to the science. Very cool. Um, I am excited that there are more. Um, video resources out there, and I can't wait to check out this trailer. Um, yeah. Just the spell from it is gorgeous. So thanks for being on the call, and thanks for sharing that. Thanks. Um, and then uh, Kurt or Moose or Shannon? Yeah, this is Shannon Waters, um, and I just my my question was kind of to Hillary's point about taking um, and in the webinar it mentioned you know taking that that call to action, taking the message beyond education, and actually giving people tangible goals that they can work towards. So Hillary, I'm really interested to see what your outcome is, and I'm wondering if anyone else on the call has done anything that has um, promoted personal behavior change, because some of the messaging I've read in the past and heard in the past about especially climate change and these kind of more complex issues is that it's really hard to give people the, well, it, it's necessary to try to pair up the, the complexity of the issue with a solution that's going to seem like it's making a difference and not just telling people bike to work one day um, because that doesn't necessarily seem like it's going to translate into to real solutions. So I'm wondering if anyone else has some experience there. Um, maybe, Hillary, I'll just keep an eye on your campaign. Yeah, we'd like to share results. And I, we've worked with some people, too, about sharing about offshore wind farms in the future and kind of bigger solutions to big problems. 
But our first goal is still educating our constituency that there is a problem, and we think the personal action at least will help us connect with them again. Very cool. Um, and we saw a few more hands raised, uh, Moose and Kurt, I think. Sorry, I haven't unmute, and you may need to unmute your personal phone, too, just in case you're Hello. double muted. Yep. Can you hear us now, Ocean Science Stress? Sure, can. Mr. O'Donnell? Oh, great. Hi, this is Haley Carter and Ruth O'Donnell, and we just uh, we noticed on the map that's noticeably absent is the state of California, and we wanted to <laughs> mention the work that's going on on the West Coast. And we have um, at the Ocean Science Trust, we've been working with the Ocean Protection Council to convene a West Coast-wide panel that includes California, Oregon, Washington, and British Columbia, so thousands of miles of coastline. And these are leading scientists and uh, a strong political collaboration with the West Coast Governors Alliance that are working to uh, work with local managers and, and look at opportunities to incorporate ocean acidification hypoxia into ways they already manage the resources. So highlighting that marine protected areas are great areas to um, look at where we can protect and build ecosystem resilience in the face of these threats to our oceans. And wanted to highlight that at AAAS coming up in San Jose on the 15th of this month, the Deputy Secretary for Coast, Ocean and Coastal Matters, uh, Kat Coleman, and also two of the ocean acidification hypoxia panelists, Francis Chan, who works heavily on hypoxia on the West Coast, and also Tessa Hill, who's working at Bodega Marine Lab on oysters, um, that they're going to be speaking in a session. And this is a great opportunity to tap into Team Ocean. So this is not just an ocean conference, but lots of press are going to be there. And we would love your help in um, creating buzz around this and um, highlighting the work that um, these scientists are doing on the West Coast and amplifying some of the messages. So um, just wanted to throw that in there. And if you wanted to check out more about the panel, it's westcoastoah.org. And um, um, thank you so much for this opportunity to um, Thanks. Yay. Um, definitely we're interested in hearing more updates on that work um, and make sure some good links and dates get into the um, Acidinar notes that are at bit.ly um, slash Acidinar notes, all lowercase, and we'll make sure that information gets out to this crew. Thank you so much Great. for doing that. Great. We will work. do that. Yay. We will do that. Thanks. Um, and I know we're trying to get um, Kurt Davies off mute. Did, we're, ha are we successful? Kurt, can we hear you? Sometimes it's a little fancy on Skype. Um, it sort of is, if we can't get that to work, feel free to put the stuff in the chat, and I will read it out loud. Um, so I, we're a couple minutes over, um, and we're very interested in hearing the rest of your campaigns. Um, let me get through a little bit of closing stuff, and we can hang out on the phone um, for a little bit for whoever is still available. Um, so just a quick wrap up. Um, the great big um, State of the Conversation report is launching today. Um, you can find that at the top of our blog um, or with those two bit.ly links. And this is, um, the webinar was based on the information that's in this report. Um, the report goes into a lot more depth. If you happen to be a funder and you're funding ocean acidification, um, this is definitely worth a read. And we'll give you a personal walkthrough. You can just ask us and um, we'll give you a tour of all of the stuff that we think may be relevant to people who are kind of looking at the big picture of this conversation. Um, what's ahead for Upwell is that um, we are shutting down our ocean um, program, um, the Upwell program, at the end of March. Um, and there's some more information about that on our blog. Um, but this is one of a couple of activities that are really important to us to do um, before the end of March um, when we're shutting down. So we wanted to get this ocean acidification information out there. Um, you can expect to receive an invitation in short order to the overfishing in our catch in our Visionar. Um, we haven't quite named that one yet, but we will be doing the same process, research process, and sharing out um, tips and kind of high-level um, analysis of the overfishing conversation. Um, in case anyone's interested, we're also working with um, Stamen, uh, awesome design lab, as part of the Parks Forward Initiative in California. Um, there's a park in our tomorrow that's about California parks, um, some of which are BT parks some of my favorites are. So um, there's the overfishing in our, the park in our is coming, um, and uh, a trunk in our is coming if you're interested in elephants. Um, you can join up 
uh, with Team Ocean by following Upwell, um, and the Tide Report is still going to be active and kick cranking out some great information as we do go through the rest of our ocean closeout opportunities. Um, thank you, everybody, for being on the phone today. Um, you're a really lovely part of Team Ocean, and we enjoy working with you so much. Um, thanks for all you're doing to amplify and fund and film and take photos and science. Um, you guys are doing a great job. Um, and this is, uh, as you saw from the graphs, the ocean acidification in it conversation is in a much different place than it was a year or two years ago. Um, and that's due to the hard work of the people who are on the phone today. Um, so that's my closeout stuff. Um, and we can definitely, I see Andrew and Kurt um, still have their hand raised, hands raised. If anybody needs to hop off, we totally understand. Um, and I'll keep the lines open for another 10 or 15 minutes um, to talk through uh, any questions people have um, and to share out the ocean acidification. Um, communications challenges and campaigns you guys are working on. So we'll start seven to unmute and hop on in. Hi, this is Andrew Cornblad of the Online Ocean Symposium. Uh, hey, Andrew. Wanted, how's it going? Uh, really excellent uh, uh, seminar so far. I uh, really enjoyed it. Uh, one thing that I wanted to kind of touch on is that um, one of the things that we've been kind of dancing around is this concept that's been around for quite a while but is gaining a lot of traction recently, and that's mindfulness, going beyond just education but also education about personal actions. And uh, there's been a couple of different moves on this at things like South by Southwest Eco and other you know, eco-tech uh, conferences, bringing into the uh, play of uh, personal apps that allow you to identify like what your carbon footprint is based off of your choices, not only on energy but also on purchases. And um, one of the things that it, you know personally I would really love to see happen is some sort of collaborative work between uh, a campaign on education and a campaign on you know tracking personal what have you, and possibly even trying to gamify that system uh, through you know social sharing and, and that sort of thing, kind of taking some lessons from uh, other campaigns and applying it to the acidification uh, conversation. And that's really just my main point. Very cool. Um, is anybody working on campaigns like that? Um, feel free to put those in the notes or um, take yourself off mute and share them out right now. It's a great direction for sure. Um, and the question that we had come in on the chat, um, Kurt, we couldn't get off mute. I'm so sorry. Um, if the uh, ocean acidification hoax stuff from Breitbart, um, what's up with that, and other um, places have hit our radar, um, and they have hit our radar, but haven't seen them being shared widely by anyone who's influential, influential on social media. Um, so there's definitely some... Um, some backlash stuff out there. Um, it so far isn't doesn't seem to be gaining much traction, um, but it's definitely um, worth keeping tabs on um, the denier part of this conversation um, is is uh, one we should not ignore. And Rachel, I would just add that um, I have actually seen um, some of the Breitbart content get a lot of Facebook shares. It's usually sort of a uh, a big, uh, you know, spike and then sort of a long tail as it, as it ricochets around um, denier communities on Facebook. Um, and I, I think that it's definitely something to be aware of because the volume of those communities is bigger than um, the folks who are sort of actively um, educating and um, mobilizing people to take on ocean acidification. So as the climate denial community um, realizes, you know, just how um, compelling, you know, the real science is on ocean acidification, they're likely to see that as more of a threat, and you'll, this is a trend that will continue. So um, it's definitely something to get ahead of, and it's not, something, it's not something that should be dismissed out of hand just because, you know, in the last couple of years they haven't been paying as much attention. More recently, they have been um, starting to uh, give it more coverage, and I, I suspect that that will increase, and, that, you know, that's based on some of my experience in the, you know, the uh, climate movement. Thanks, Matt. Um, anybody else? Uh, I see Shannon Waters. You have our hand up. I'm not sure if that's from before. I um, want to jump in with um, some quick comments on questions or campaigns that you have. 
No, actually, that was just from before. <laughs> Thank you, though. Oh, okay. Thanks, Anna. Cool. Well, I think that's all of our questions for today. Um, that was a marathon of Fit and R. Um, we still have 42 people on the phone, which is amazing. Um, thank you all for your um, commitment to learning more and improving how we all talk about um, this issue that I think I don't have to argue on this call is an important one. Um, so thanks for all your hard work, and let us know how Upwell can help you, especially in the near term, um, be more successful in your communications efforts. We love doing it um, and are happy to help out. And with that, I will conclude the seminar. Thank you so much, Matt and Ray, especially Ray, for um, slogging through lots of talking on a day when your voice wasn't so strong. So huge research efforts um, by Matt and Ray, so much data crunching, and I'm really grateful that we could get this information out. Thanks for caring, guys.